premier. Alberta's friendship with Ukraine goes back more than a century, and our province has the largest population of Ukrainian Canadians in Canada. Over the years, Ukrainians have shaped Alberta's culture and helped us to build into the incredible province that we are today. When Russia invaded eastern Ukraine two years ago, Alberta immediately rallied in defense of our Ukrainian friends. And since then, we have welcomed tens of thousands of Ukrainian evacuees seeking refuge in our province under the Canada-Ukraine Author Authorization for Emergency Travel Visa Program, commonly known as QED. I should just also clarify, um, as of my most recent update, we have had over 57,000 Ukrainian evacuees come to Alberta alone, and it continues to grow every day. We're proud to be a beacon of hope and safety for those fleeing war in Ukraine, and we are proud to welcome newcomers from around the world. Our growing economy demands it. Across our province, businesses are struggling to fill up job vacancies across industries. We need more skilled workers to continue to propel our economy forward. We know that Alberta is an attractive destination as well. Um, and we want to offer long-term stability as well as certainty to all newcomers who have chosen to settle in Alberta. However, Ottawa is preventing us from being able to do that. The federal government recently notified us that Alberta will not receive any increase in the number of provincial nomination spaces through the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program. In fact, my Minister of Immigration tells me that they've reduced the amount that we got last year um, by a certain amount. And this will make it difficult for our government to give Ukrainian evacuees the certainty that they need to build a future here by helping them become permanent residents. We don't think that this is fair, and we're concerned that this is one more example of the federal government interfering in our provincial jurisdiction. Section 95 of the Constitution, let me read it here, gives concurrent power over immigration to both provincial legislatures as well as the federal government. Let me read this for you. It says, respecting, incidentally, both agriculture and immigration, in each province, the legislature may make laws in relation to immigration into the province, and it is hereby declared that the, Par the Parliament of Canada may from time to time make laws in relation to immigration into any or all of the provinces. And any law of the legislature of a province relative to immigration shall have effect in and for the province as long as and insofar as it is not repugnant to any act of the Parliament of Canada. So we believe that we actually have uh, not only concurrent power to manage immigration, but that the Constitution affirms our right to do so. And Alberta remains a willing partner in federal provincial relations, but we cannot be the only ones at the table. Ottawa needs to stop making decisions and enacting policies that run counter to the Constitution. And we will continue to push back when our provincial rights are interfered with. The simple fact is that we want what's best for Alberta. We want to welcome newcomers, including Ukrainians, who have the skill sets that we need to keep our economy moving and growing. For Ukrainian evacuees, Alberta's stability and opportunity offer much needed sanctuary from the chaos and danger in Ukraine. And the promise of a better life here among friendly Albertans is the best gift that we can offer them during this unimaginable time. Our growing economy is creating a labor shortage in some of our critical industries, including construction, technology, healthcare, and education. This shortage hinders our ability to grow and reach our full economic potential, something that all of Canada has relied on for years. With so many Ukrainian evacuees arriving right at a time when we have a labor shortage, Ottawa limiting our ability to offer permanent residency doesn't make much sense. That's why I've written to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau today to ask for an increase in our nomination spaces for this year from less than 10,000 to 20,000 with immediate effect. In addition, we're asking for 10,000 new spaces specifically for Ukrainian evacuees. I should mention that even though we're only 12% of the population, we are getting 23% of the Ukrainian evacuees who are seeking refuge in our country. That's the reason why we want to have a special program that allows for us to settle them. I've also asked Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, Mark Miller, for a meeting to discuss concerns around immigration strategy. We have the opportunities that Ukrainians are looking for, and we know that so many are still anxious to come here whether for the short or the long term. And we are working to ensure that they can access supports and services to help them adjust to life as needed. 
And I'm so pleased to say that just last week, we added hotel surge capacity so that eligible Ukrainians can count on having emergency accommodation for up to 14 days when they first arrive. Over the past two years, there have been a wide variety of supports available, including a welcome desk at both Edmonton and Calgary airports and a telephone helpline that offers services in Ukrainian. We launched a Ukrainian evacuee support program to help with language and employment supports and emerging needs. We have provided employment services through the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers and the Center for Newcomer Society of Calgary, as well as providing apprenticeship training. And we brought in a driver's license exchange program. And I'm pleased to share that these services remain available today and will continue to be available for the foreseeable future. And we're also actively working to extend access to key services such as healthcare and emergency financial supports past April 30th of this year. These measures have been offered in the spirit of friendship and solidarity that our province shares with the people of Ukraine and our determination to support them through this crisis. We can never fully understand the depth of tragedy our Ukrainian friends have experienced, nor the perseverance they continue to show. What we can do is make sure that we are able to help them the best ways that we can so that we can move forward from the pain and fear of living in a war zone and feel at home right here in Alberta. We stand alongside every Ukrainian evacuee who has come to our province over the past two years, and we will continue to do so. Over the past two years, we've heard inspiring stories from every corner of the province about the everyday kindness and generosity of Albertans and about the many ways that Ukrainian newcomers are thriving here. We want to give more Ukrainians the chance to thrive by offering them a home here in our province. And all we ask is for Ottawa to let us do just that. Thank you, Premier. We'll now go into the media Q&A portion of this event. Uh, we'll start off with questions here in the room before going over to the phones. Our reminder, we'll be taking one question, one follow-up. And please state your name and outlet before you ask a question. Hi, it's Shayla Anskowski with CTV News uh, in Edmonton here. My question for the Premier, I apologize, it is off topic. Uh, the Prime Minister penned an open letter to you and other Premiers opposed to the carbon tax defending the policy, saying that it is demonstrably false that the tax is contributing to inflation, and says if you and other Premiers are opposed, you should offer a better climate action plan. What is your response to that letter, and what plan will you be submitting to the PM? Well, look, we have offered a better climate action plan that would see us get to uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 doing um, major industrial emissions. And in fact, I think there was a recent report that said that it's these kinds of major industrial emissions reduction projects that are having an impact and carbon taxes aren't. And I would just quote the environment minister, Stephen Gibault, who said that he didn't think that the carbon tax was going to have an impact until 2060. So they've even acknowledged that their carbon tax is not working. So I've been asked uh, by Kelly McCauley, the government and Oper operations and estimates chair of the committee, to, to present to his committee, which I'll be doing at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And I will make all of these points. And uh, I'm the, the prime minister, I made the point with him when I met him um, a, a week ago, was that because the carbon tax is not rebated to businesses. Every small business has to take the cost of that fuel, has to take the cost of the, uh, of the natural gas heating. They have to work it into their prices. That's why it's inflationary. In addition, the Parliamentary Budget Office has said that the amount of tax that people pay is higher than the amount of the rebate by about $900, and I think it's going to grow by two thousand to $2,000, that differential by 2030. Those are the reasons why they have to put a pause on it. When you're in the middle of an inflation and affordability crisis, um, having um, a tax that is not achieving the desired purpose is it should be really the first thing to be put on pause. And my follow-up, uh, switching gears a little bit to another level of government, we're hearing reports your government is considering a move to stabilize and audit the city of Edmonton. Senior officials told Post Media your government is alarmed at what you are hearing. Um, are you considering such an audit? And, and what are you hearing that might motivate that decision? Well, I, I think it's um, Edmonton's story to tell um, about well, where they, they find themselves. Um, we've, we've had an, a number of, uh, of, of reports that do have us concerned. We stand by ready to assist if, if they would, a, would like to ask us for assistance. Um, but I, I understand that there's just a, 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 a couple of, of a serious financial challenges that they're facing. We've seen, I believe it's now eight senior executives, including the, the city manager leave. That, that's a, a sign that has us concerned about stability. So uh, my staff have reached out to um, Mayor Sohi's staff to just 
let them know that if uh, we should, we're standing ready if they need any particular assistance. And Minister um, of Municipal Affairs Rick, M Rick McIver has said the same as well. But I, for the specifics, I would just perhaps direct you to, to talk to a council member so that they can tell you the nature of what it is that they're dealing with. Hi, Premier Brandon Carson Smith from Global News Edmonton. To follow up on that last point, uh, maybe you could just clarify. So you're waiting on the city to ask for help. That's a clarification, and then I do have a question. Correct, yeah, the, the, uh, we're just waiting on the city to ask for help. It may be that they're able to work through these problems on their own, and look, it's a big step if you, um, if you uh, try to intervene in any council's decision-making, let alone a city as large and, and uh, important as, as our capital city, and so we would not take that decision likely, uh, lightly, and we would, we would want them to be very specific about whether they think we can help and how they would like us to help. So we, we just let them know and we're on standby if they, if they need to, to make that call. Has your government received any reports or complaints that the City of Edmonton is awarding contracts to one of the councillor's associates or partners? Um, I would say I've, I've heard that a letter is coming in to uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. I've not seen that letter, uh, but, as, um, but I would maybe direct you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs to, to see what his comment is on that. Uh, yesterday during Legends, your chief of staff was telling reporters that he'd heard of fraud and bullying within the city of Edmonton. Uh, presumably he would bring those concerns and allegations to you. So uh, what has your government done about those allegations? Look, I mean, I, I don't want to prejudge what what may or, or may not be in a letter that uh, we've been told that we'll receive. And so I, I just would, wouldn't mind seeing the letter, talking to my, my municipal affairs minister and seeing if there's anything more that we need to do. But at the at the moment, I've, I've not seen the letter. We've not received it yet. I, I, I've just been told it's on the way. Are fraud and bullying the correct words? I, I would just say I don't want to mischaracterize because I don't know the full details. And so I'd, I'd rather just wait and see what the, what the letter says. Jonathan Bradley, Western Standard. Suppose you follow through on taking over Edmonton's, uh, the city of Edmonton. What would that timeline look like? There, there's no decision in that regard at all um, because I would, I would say there's lots of ways that we can assist a municipality that is having difficulty. But um, in the case of, of a city as uh, like a, the capital city, it's our second largest city in the province. We we would want to we would want to make sure that we're we're working with them to address the particular needs that they have. And so we've just put the the word out uh, through the mayor's office as, as well as through our municipal affairs minister that uh, we, we stand by and ready to help if if they think they need our assistance. You and uh, Edmonton Mayor Emergy so he have uh, clashed in the last year over various issues. What priorities do you want to see him? focus on when it comes to uh, problems within the city of Edmonton? Hmm. I don't know that we've clashed. I think we've actually worked together quite collaboratively. And uh, when you look at the measures that, that we took to clear the encampments, we just did an announcement on that yesterday. Um, having the, uh, the city as a partner and being able to clear over 700 encampments, set up our navigation center, ensure that we have got supports in place. I, I think that that's actually been an example of a really good collaboration, and I hope we can do do more of that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go over to the phones. Operator, could you put through our first caller, please? Lauren Boothby, Edmonton Journal. Hi, Premier. Um, if you're concerned about um, Edmonton's finances, um, is Alberta government considering, you know, maybe remitting some more funding back to the cities? I know there's been some requests about you know, photo radar and about taxes for government buildings. Could that be a way to help uh, stabilize some of the financial challenges of the city? I'd, I'd like to see sort of the full um, array of proposals that they would have if they have any for us. Um, the, I, 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 I don't know the magnitude of the challenge that they're facing, so I don't know if the measures you've just identified would be sufficient. So it, it may be that we have to, to look at a whole menu of options, but we, we're just on standby waiting to see what kind of assistance they might need from us. Also, earlier this week, um, yeah, the Municipal Affairs Minister said your government would let Medicine City Hat figure their situation out. Mm -hmm. um, you've only intervened twice, I believe, in other municipalities. So, you know, why is Edmonton being considered for more scrutiny and not Medicine Hat? And does this have anything to do with the political leanings of the people Edmontonians uh, elected to represent them in this case? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's. I think they're different circumstances. From what I understand about Medicine Hat, they're they're very healthy from a financial point of view. They have their own gas company. They operate their own power company. Um, they're they're they've got a, a massive 
uh, fund that they have for some of their surplus revenue. So I, I think the nature of the of the uh, challenges in, in Medicine Hat are, are quite different than what we're hearing uh, about the challenges in Edmonton. Thank you, Lauren. Operator, can you put through our next caller, please? Michelle Belfontaine, CBC. Um, oh, hi there, Premier. Thank you for taking my question. I just want to follow up on what Lauren just asked about Medicine Hat. Mm. So you're saying that, I mean, it, it appears from all reports that the council is dysfunctional. Mm. Um, yeah, you're not concerned because their financial status is fine. So I wonder if you can, you can explain that because... Um, I don't know. It, it, it just seems that it, it is quite a serious situation down there. Well, I don't... Look, um, we don't intervene just uh, because there are personality conflicts in a council. Otherwise, we'd be intervening on a lot of councils. We, we have to identify if the uh, level of infighting is causing a major exodus of senior staff. That would be one thing because the continuity of providing services is done through the administration. So we haven't observed that in Medicine Hat. That I think would be one difference. Uh, the other difference would be um, the the issue of, of being able to abide by the Municipal Government Act, which does not allow for deficits to be run. My understanding, if I'm remembering this correctly, is that in a three-year budget cycle, there has to be a balanced budget. And so if that is something that is unachievable, that becomes a, another level that uh, we would have to, to inter, intervene on. And then I guess the third thing, because I, I suppose Chestermere would be maybe the other example where there was an intervention. You have to follow the law, and in the case of the Municipal Government Act as well, uh, council members are, are not allowed to meet as a majority and make decisions outside of, of caucus chambers. And when that occurs, that's, that's also a violation of legislation. So I would just say that, that each of these situations are, are all different. And, and so the, the minister likes to have a, a light touch. He, um, he certainly doesn't want to be, be intervening in all cases if there's, if there's just a, a personality conflict. We have to be looking at it through the lens of, of whether there is any danger that laws are going to be broken in the Municipal Government Act or whether there's going to be a, a danger in delivering on services. Um, as a follow-up, though, I mean, you know, anybody who is looking at this situation premier is going because let's face it i mean i know that you just said that you and and and, and uh, mayor so he get along but your government has clashed with the city of edmonton and so people anybody who's looking at this from the outside is going to say oh isn't that interesting that they want to intervene in the affairs of of, of of the city of edmonton i mean are they i mean have they have they posted a deficit they're not allowed to under the law so I'm, what, I'm just wondering, like, you know, what would you say to people who are very suspicious about your government's uh, motives here, and even having this message come out via a columnist? Um, well, look, um, as I understand it, there was a, a, a pretty um, involved meeting at the council a number of days ago that talked about the financial challenges the city is facing. I, if that's there's a number of people who were, who were at that meeting and a number of them started calling us. And so that's how we heard about it. Um, but we're just letting the city know that we're on standby if the uh, things that we're hearing are true and if they need any assistance. And um, I mean, we've been watching the media as well uh, in, in seeing the, the exodus of senior officials over the, the last 12 months. That, that is unusual. Um, and when you've got a, a major city that has a, the kind of budget and the kind of responsibility Edmonton does, and you lose seven or eight of your senior staff, and then you're hearing of, of meetings where they, they talk about very serious financial challenges, it, 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 it would be irresponsible of me not to pay attention to that. So we're paying attention. We want the, um, the, the council to know and the mayor to know that we are on standby if, if they need to talk to us to be able to help them through this. No one stepped in. No one has intervened. No one is doing an audit. No one is, uh, is, is taking any extraordinary measures. But if they need our help, then we are ready, we're ready and, and on standby to help. Thanks, Michelle. We have time for one last question. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Alexander Diwali, Rebel News. Thank you, Premier, for taking my question. Mm -hmm. um, so on the carbon tax, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau claimed the provinces have now proposed better solutions to the tax and have yet to meet federal standards for reducing emissions. What is your response to that, given the federal government has yet to meet a single emissions target? 
Well, I can tell you, we have met our methane emissions reduction target, met it early by, by 45% uh, percent below the uh, 2005 20, uh, levels. We, we were so, uh, hoping to achieve that by 2025. We achieved it early. Um, glad to be sharing a stage with Premier Ed Stelmack, who had the, the foresight to invest in a major project for the, the Quest uh, carbon capture project, which was a $700 million dollar investment that has an at-scale carbon capture utilization and storage project along with the, with the, uh, the, the uh, carbon trunk line. And that is the reason why we are attracting investments from Dow Chemical for their net zero petrochemical plant, Air Products for their net zero hydrogen plant, Heidelberg for their net zero cement plant. We just um, uh, announced the, the opening of the, the first private operated hydrogen fueling station just outside of, of Edmonton in Leduc County as, the, as the, the backbone to start building out our hydrogen infrastructure. We've been working with AMTA uh, and along with the federal government on dual fuel semis so that they can, so we can reduce the, the carbon emissions profile on that. We, we, we launched um, again with the federal government a, uh, the, the, an Edmonton bus and a Strathcona bus that is also hydrogen based. We are, are working with the federal government to see if there's an avenue for us to export more LNG and ammonia so that we can reduce emissions internationally. Uh, we, the carbon capture utilization and storage capacity that we have here is really second only to Russia in the amount of pore space that we have. And we've already mapped out 25 different hubs and we're beginning to see major projects like Pathways working towards building a, a carbon trunk line in partnership. An agreement with uh, other provinces and uh, Saskatchewan in particular to explore small modular reactors and interties so that we can reduce emissions that way. We have proposals for how we have proposals for how we may be able to do pump storage on electricity to also be able to make better use of our solar and wind resources. We've taken the pause of renewables so that people can see what the, what the siting decisions and reclamation decisions will be for where solar and wind need to be uh, uh, need to be sited. Um, we, we have Capital Power that has also announced a partnership with OPG on developing a small modular reactor. Uh, we've developed um, and funded $1.7 billion dollars worth of emissions reduction pilot projects through Emissions Reduction Alberta. One of them, uh, Carbon Engineering, went on to be sold to Occidental for a billion dollars to roll out 300 direct air capture. Uh, facilities. I mean, like you see, uh, the geothermal, we, we, we helped fund Ever, which just launched a major project in Germany to be able to put 200,000 homes on geothermal. We are doing t like endless number of things to be able to achieve our emissions targets. And for the Prime Minister to act as if a carbon tax, which is not working, is punitive, his own environment minister has said is not working, is the solution, is just plain wrong. All of the other things that I have mentioned, the innovation and the, and the industrial development, those are the things that are going to get us to carbon neutrality. And I would, will be more than happy to detail our carbon emissions and energy development plan in, uh, when I have my, my presentation tomorrow at 9 a.m. And did you have a follow-up? And as a follow-up to, um, am I able to ask a yeah, follow-up? Okay, thank you. Uh, so as a follow-up to that, uh, the Alberta government proposed a Crown Corporation last fall to reject federal clean energy regulations and shelter Albertans from soaring electricity costs. Uh, your government says the push for net zero uh, power grid by 2035 will force Albertans into brownouts and blackouts, yet those concerns have fallen on deaf ears from the federal government. Now, Premier, what is the progress on that Crown Corporation and do you have a timeline on its implementation? We, we don't want to have to set up a Crown Corporation, but we will because what we need to do, and I was just meeting with a solar company yesterday that is working on five major installations in our province and we had a very frank discussion about the reason why solar and wind are able to look at Alberta as a destination point is because they have backup in the form of the peaker plants that levels the, the load. So we need to be able to bring on natural gas to balance off when solar and wind don't are, aren't working. And so the, the those who are in the industry of solar and wind recognize that, we recognize that. The only one who doesn't seem to recognize that is the federal government and Stephen Guibault. We will always use best available technology 
in order to be able to capture CO2 emissions. It just so happens that it's not perfect at the moment. And any company that is starting now does not want to have a stranded asset. They don't want to be told to turn off on January 1st, 2035, or that their directors are going to go to jail. That's what we're trying to mitigate against. So if we can have the private sector work in partnership with us and shield them from federal overreach, that's what we're going to do. But uh, in this basin, in, in this environment, having solar and wind with natural gas backup, having natural gas as a base load, um, as well as uh, developing out as much hydro and hydro storage as we can, as well as developing out a small modular nuclear when it becomes available, that's our pathway to 2050. Those things take time and you just can't rush technological change. Thank you, Alex, and that'll be it for questions today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.